Okay, well, this is Dr. Morton recording the video for the uh, 23rd, Monday the 23rd. So we have, uh, we have Monday uh, and Wednesday of this week and Monday and Wednesday of next week, and that's it. That'll be the end of school. So essentially two partial weeks. Um, so we're just going to kind of review for the final. Uh, hopefully, uh, I'll, do, I'll try and do some, uh, some help sessions if anybody's struggling with their final project. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So you don't have to turn your final project in until the last day of class. You can upload a video. Uh, and then I'm not sure about the final exam. Uh, uh, we'll try and take a little... I'll try and take. I'll send out an email and take a little survey. Um, we can take it on the date that it's scheduled for uh, during the final exam period, uh, or uh, we can take it a little bit earlier and get it done. Um, your call. So uh, I'll see what you say, and we'll just do that. It's not going to be super hard. It's going to be multiple choice questions, basically. I'm not going to have you write a lot of code. I might. I might have a few example pieces of code. But there'll be short little segments, maybe an always block, maybe something about uh, a parameter, just a few things like that. It won't be, it's not like you're going to have to write any code. That's, that's really what the final project's all about. Okay, uh, so I did want to talk a little bit about Artrix 7 features, and then I'll review, talk a little bit more about the final exam. Uh, let's see, I was going to pull up the uh, syllabus. Yeah, so here it is, right? Yeah, right. Right. So, last day of classes, the second, and that's when projects are due. Uh, obviously, Thanksgiving, we won't have any class. Um, so, I really want you to get all your labs done by Wednesday of this week. So, I will be in lab Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Come on in. Get help. Get them done. There's no excuse not to get your labs done. So, get your butt in there and get them done. Okay, um, and then, uh, so currently the final exam is scheduled for the 11th, but if you want it to move it up, that's fine. So just be thinking about that. We'll, we'll do a little survey maybe on Wednesday. I'll send out, or this week sometime I'll send out an email. Okay, okay, so we'll talk a little bit about the Artrix 7, um, the topology of the slice, and some programming consideration. I've really covered all this somewhat already, but this is just a little bit of a summary. So... The number of programmable bits is fixed at 30 million. However, it says the minimum size flash to, uh, memory to hold uh, is 32K, but the numbers don't add up. Uh, 32K even times 8 bits, uh, so 32K bytes won't get anywhere close to 30 million. Um, so I don't know, that'll only get you up to about, well, 8 times 32, 8 times 30, 3 times 8, so that's only 240 or something like that. So that's only 240k bits, and uh, that's just nowhere near this. So I I don't know. I'm not sure. I I'm not sure. I got these numbers off of their uh, uh, their description, but it's a little confusing to me. But that's the number of that's the mat, that's the number of programming bits. Um, now obviously you may not use you may not program all those bits, but you can set it up so that it can write it in less than a second. Although that's really whaling, and it's gonna have you're gonna have to have some really fast memory, and you're gonna have to have uh, and you're gonna have to do it in parallel, no doubt. All right. The Xilinx 7 series FPGAs were designed for maximum flexibility. Uh, it's it can either automatically load itself with configuration data from you know like a flash memory or an EEPROM, EEPROM, um, or you can program it from a microprocessor. A microcontroller, or you can uh, 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 download it, uh, you know, from a, from a microcomputer. The configuration data can also, well, yeah, it can be downloaded through to uh, through the J, JTAG. It can be downloaded from a host computer through a cable to the JTAG port. So there is a JTAG port built into each FPGA, and that's the joint uh, test for us. Um, the joint test, yeah, and we talked about JTAG and how that controller works, and it basically uh, can, can it has a little uh, the ability to shift bits around to all the input pins, and then uh, and then 
um, it can it can also use it to program through the JTAG controller that's built into the chip. Um, all right, so the self-loading uh, configuration modes are generally called master modes, and they can be serial or parallels. Uh, and usually you put the non-volatile memory that you're going to load into the chip on the same board as the chip, but it is external to the FPGA. Uh, the FPGA can generate the clock signal that drives the configuration process. There is a module within the FPGA, the FPGA that will do that in, within the Artrix 7. Um, then you can program it in slave node. That's, that's what we do uh, when we download it from Vivado. Um, the bit stream in the, in, when you do slave mode can be stored anywhere. It doesn't have to be on the same board or anything. It can be in a hard drive on a desktop. You can, and you can also use parallel or serial, but you do, have to, you do need an external intelligent controller to do this. So here's serial. So you process or a microcontroller, and you have serial data in and a clock, and away it goes. Uh, it's really half of an SPI, essentially. Then you can do the JTAG, where you have data out, data in, and data out and back, data back in. Uh, and then you have a clock and you have a mode select. And that's, that's the JTAG controller on the, uh, on the uh, Artrix 7. And then you can also send things in. Instead of serial, you can do it. Uh, you can do either bytes, half words, or words. And you need a select line and a read write and a clock. There are other uh, configuration things you can do. Uh, you may have your FPGA connected to a system that already has extra non-volatile memory on it, and so you can just put your uh, bit file on that. It could, it could be in a hard drive. Um, in cases where you have to power up quickly, you usually want to go for the parallel solution. Avoid daisy chaining them, like where you're using a, a JTAG port that's daisy chained through 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 several ICs, and uh, obviously the faster the memory you have, uh, where the application is stored, the faster you can sp uh, speed up configuration. Um, there is a little bit of an issue with having the bit file uh, not on the uh, the FPGA. There is some increased risk for reverse engineering, however. The, you can you can encrypt the bitstream with uh, AES encryption, and the Artrix 7 has a built-in AES decryption logic. Um, so you store the file off the chip and then in this non-volatile encrypted form. All right. So the Vertrex 7 uses a stack silicon interconnect technology, which is basically a, a three-dimensional integrated circuit. Uh, the Artrix 7, though, however, uses monolithic silicon technology, standard. Uh, the configurable logic box. So it has, it has a six input lookup table, and you can make it dual LUT5 option if you want. It has distributed memory, and it has the ability to function as a shift register. You can, uh, it also has a dedicated high-speed carry logic for math, uh, and then it has these wide multiplexers for, for efficient utilization. So you can, uh, you have uh, two different slices within each logic block. And they connect to this switch matrix, which basically then connects you to the general routing matrix. So you can send those, those outputs and inputs, inputs and outputs can come from or go anywhere. And each block has two slices. The LUT6 uh, can be a, a single LUT6 with one output, or two LUT5s with separate outputs, but the five input variables have to be the same. And then you have uh, all seven all seven series families in, in the Xilinx uh, ecosystem have the same uh, configurable logic blocks. The uh, 
so the logic cell is the measure of device capacity, and the the, the relate the, the ratio uh, the relation of a st standard logic cell to a LUT six is one point six to one, and this logic cell I think is part of that uh, part of that that um, standard um, um, measures that we can compare uh, various uh, different type of uh, FPGAs against. So a slice has four LUT sixes and eight flip flops, and then it has this arithmetic arithmetic carry logic. It has a bunch of multiplexers, and it has two slices that make up a configurable logic block. You can use up to four flip flops per slice as latches, but the remaining four flip flops, flip -flops would have to be unused then. So six input lookup tables, and the lookup tables are labeled uh, A, B, C, and D. So you have lookup table A, lookup table B, lookup table C, and lookup table D for each slice. There are six completely independent uh, inputs, A1 through A6, or B1 through B6, C1, C1 through C6, and D1 through D6. And those those have to be those are the same. There are two independent outputs, O5 and O6, output five and output six for each, uh, for each um, of the two LUTs. So any six variable Boolean function can be implemented with a LUT six, and two five input Boolean functions with common inputs. And then you can have an arbitrarily defined Boolean functions of three and two inputs or less, where the inputs aren't common. The six input function uses A one through six as inputs and output six as the output. The two, the two five inputs or less function uses the A one through A five. The A six input is driven high. Uh, and then the O five and O six are the two outputs. So uh, the slices also contain multiplexers, and they contain this F7A mux, F7B mux, and the F8 mux. And they combine two or four lookup tables to generate seven and eight input functions. And the way you get the extra inputs is the control lines to the LUTs, to the, to the muxes. So you get the same six variables to each of the each of the lookup tables, but then you have the uh, control lines for the muxes that give you an extra variable, and that can give you the seven or the eight functions. You have to use four LUTs for the eight functions, two LUTs for the seven, for the, uh, sorry. If you're, if you're gonna have eight, vari eight input variables, then you have to have the four, uh, use four lookup tables and uh, the multiplexers. So the F7A mux generates seven input functions from A and B, and the F7B mux generates seven input functions from C and D. So again, the control line to the mux is the seventh variable, and the six variables then are for the LUT sixes for A, the LUT six A, and the LUT six B. And then the the two outputs of those are then are selected by the uh, multiplexer, and that's the seventh variable. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Yeah, so I think maybe I should draw that out. Um, let me pop myself back on here. I should have been putting myself on all the time. So I expand this and let me flip it down to the to the camera. Okay. So if if we have. So basically, so so you have a you have a LUT six, which has variables A. Well, which has variables. Um, well, we'll call them we'll call them we'll call them uh, V uh, one, V two, V three, 
v4, v5, and v6. All right, but if you want a 7 variable, then you have to have v7. So how does this work? Well, you have another lot here with the same 6. And then the output of this and the output of this go to uh, go to a 2 to 1 mux with a control line. And here is where you put in your 7th variable. So that's how you get 7 variables. And if you want 8 variables, then you have to replicate this. So V7 drives these two. You can't really see the bottom of that. So you have we replicate it and you so all all of these, these A, B, C, and D, lot six, lot sixes, all of those, all of those lot sixes have the same input, same six input variables. Same six. And then the seventh variable drives these two mucks, these two two to ones, and the eighth variable drives this one. And that's how you can get an eight variable from uh, from your your one uh, slice. No, maybe it's from both slices. Yeah. So I think that takes up the whole logic block. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, um, so yeah, I guess this is one slice that can do this. Yes, functions with more than eight, input, eight, eight inputs need multiple slices. And you can't do it with direct connection, so you, it gets to be a little bit of a fiddle. Um, so your slice storage elements. So you have eight flip-flops per slice, and they can be edge-triggered D, or they can be level-sensitive transparent latches when the clock is low. Uh, if, you, if you're using... Uh, yeah, so four of them can be edge trigger D or the level sensitive latches. The other four can only be D's. So, um, yeah. The D input can be driven directly by a lookup table output uh, using the, the, uh, the, the, the flip-flop multiplexer, or you can bypass slice inputs, skip the LUTs, and use AX, BX, CX, and DX inputs directly to the flip-flop. And here's... Here's, this shows kind of both the register only and the register latch combinations in a slice. Okay, so, uh, so here's the, so here, here is your, uh, these are the outputs then from your lookup tables. This is the output from, from the, the, the LUT 6A, and it's the 05 output. LUT 6B, or it's it's a LUT 6, and it's the B LUT, and here's the output, and here's from C, and here's from D. So you have you have those outputs. Then you have the direct inputs, direct X, uh, so AX, BX, CX, and DX. And then you have your set reset, um, your SR clock. Um, well, you're set, yeah. And then you have the uh, you have the clock here, and you have the clock enable here. And uh, okay, oh, this is set reset. Yeah, the set reset line. It's that what that allows you to do. You you can't have it both ways. You either get it. It can either be a set or it can be a clear, but it can't be both. Or it can be a set or a reset. It can't be both. You have to. You only get a pick. And 
here are the choices. You can um, you can knit it to a one. You can knit it to a zero. Uh, and you can have your uh, your your set reset can be high or low active, active high or active low. And then here's your D outputs. D, uh, D, the AQ output, the BQ, the CQ, and the DQ. And your resets can be set up either asynchronous or as synchronous, which is interesting. Okay, and then here's the uh, here's the other slice. Uh, so let let A B C D, and the same thing. If this is why these this is these flip flops can be used for latches. So it's the same it's the same LUTs right four LUTs per slice four six four LUTs selects as sixes per slice A B C and D, and so the direct inputs and the LUTs are both into these multiplexers and into these, as well as the clock the uh, clock enable, and then the uh, set or reset. All right, so in these you have a few more choices. You can pick these as a flip-flop or as a latch. And otherwise you have the same other choices as you have. These can only be D flip-flops, but these can be these can be flip-flops or, or gated latches if you want. All right. So uh, so your, your, the flip-flop in your slice has three control signals, and we already looked at those. Clock. The clock enable, which is active high, the set reset, which can be uh, active high or active low, and your clock enable, the clock, the clock enable, and the set reset. So if one flip flop has a uh, clock enable or a set reset enabled, then all the others, uh, all the, the other four flip flops do too. You 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 don't get to independently choose them; they they are somewhat dependent. And there are four different initialization options available. You can use uh, you can use uh, a set or reset signal. It can be asynchronous or synchronous, and it can be either a set or a reset. So those are your four choices: asynchronous set, asynchronous reset, synchronous set, or synchronous reset. Your a knit zero and a knit one on power up are global set. Uh, they're they're global set reset, and they're asynchronous. And those are strictly on power up. Let's see. So those are the two choices. All right. Um, so the LUT propagation delays. So independent. It's independent of the function being implemented. Signals can exit the slice through A, B, C, or D outputs. So from the direct directly from the output of the LUT, or from output six. So the ABCDs are 05s, and then there's an 06 output. They can also go through the multiplexers, and they can enter the exclusive or dedicated gate from 06, or the carry logic multiplexer from 06 output. They can feed the D input of the storage element, and you can go to the, uh, the, the F7, A, and B multiplexers, uh, from the 06 output. So there are two different uh, types of slice. There is a memory slice and a logic slice. So the memory slice has two additional functions. It's got some distributed RAM for storing data and a 32-bit shift register. So every configurable logic block either has two logic slices or one logic slice and one memory slice. And I think this is, yeah, this is the memory slice. So it's a little bit more complicated than the, uh, than the other one, but it's similar. Uh, yeah, you can see it's actually very similar. There are just a, you just have a few more, um, you have a few more um, muxes stuck in here. And you've got uh, the lookup tables are slightly more complicated. 
they've got some additional inputs. All right, I'm not going to go through this because, frankly, I, I don't totally understand this. Here are your three standard control signals. but And then here are your AX, your direct inputs. And then uh, here are your outputs from your, your LUTs. And then... Um, But here, here you have your different outputs, um, and I'm a little confused about those. All right, um, so, so the Artrix 7, so here's our chip here. It has, um, it has 15,850 slices, 11,100 logic slices, and 4,750 memory. It has 63,000 LUT6s. And that's basically uh, two for each, or four for each slice. So if you multiply 15,850, you should get 63,400, I think. I hope that's right. It looks about right. And then you can have up to 1.1 uh, uh, kilobytes of, uh, no, sorry, 1,188 kilobytes of RAM, or, or 1.1 uh, megabytes. And it's got uh, 594 kilobytes of shift register, and it's got 126,800 flip-flops. It's a lot of flip-flops. And again, there's there's roughly eight uh, per block. Eight, sorry, eight per slice. So you should be able to multiply. Well, if you if you double 63,400, you should get 126,800. So you can see there's a lot of resources, and you can imagine that. Uh, Using those resources, you can generate some pretty powerful logic. Uh, pretty amazing. But you have to write the code to do it. It doesn't happen without your code. All right, distributed RAM. And this distributed RAM is largely useful for big lookup tables or if you're going to put in a soft core and you're going to program it, this is where you store your program. And you do have some single and dual port and even quad port options. And so, um, so these are the number of uh, number of lookup tables involved. And this again, distributed RAM is the RAM that's that's basically stolen from from the logic blocks. Whereas block RAM is totally separate and and is fabricated just as is in blocks, not part of the uh, uh, not part of configurable logic blocks. So carry chains, every configurable logic block has two separate carry chains. And you can, you can cascade them to make uh, greater bit, bit widths. And you can go uh, four bits per slice. And you also have a, a XR dedicated for each bit. So you can use these to cascade function generators to implement wide logic functions where you have you know, 32 bits and 64 bits. In your, in your logic functions. So you can use your, your function generator and, uh, and, and the related multiplexers and you can so, so you can have it you can get a 4 to 1 mux using one LUT. And you can get four of these four to one muxes per slice. If you need an eight to one mux, you can get two per slice. And you can get one 16 to one mux per slice. All right, so. Um, so the, uh, your, your, your HDL code, um, you just allow the, the synthesizer and the mapping tools to choose uh, how to use the uh, configurable logic blocks on the FPGA. Um, you, you should only try and instantiate specific resources when you, when you have to for either to, to fit your design into the chip or, or, to, or to get uh, the propagation delays uh, and the transport delays down to where they need to be. Um, so um, if your design's running out of 
out of resources in his target uh, device, figure out which resources, you know, limiting, fitting your design in, and then um, you can move like a you can move like a register to uh, to a uh, to dis to distributed RAM, or you can move distributed RAM to block RAM, or you can care you can uh, move your carry logic to some uh, some DSP slices. Whenever you migrate a design, make sure you don't import uh, uh, any resource instantiation requirements, mapping, or floor planning constraints. Uh, and there's a document that helps you do that if you're migrating from another chip where you may have had some of those uh, uh, resource uh, constraints. You want to remove them and let the, let the synthesizer uh, have free reign. And as long as that works, good, you're done. If that doesn't work, then you have other issues to deal with. Um, so it's recommended that you should use your sequential design techniques and pipelining to take advantage of, uh, of all the flip-flops that are available. Uh, use uh, the sets and resets as sparingly as possible. So, and it's especially a bad idea to have a globally routed reset signal um, and local resets the, this will really help maximize your, your resources. Use active high control signals, not active low. And avoid having both set and reset on the same flip-flop. That's extremely costly because they're really only set up to have one of those features. And all, all of the flip-flops in the same slice wind up having to have the same, same choice uh, once you make it. So you can't have some of them with sets, some of them with resets. Um, So if you don't have control signals, then, then your shift registers can actually uh, use lookup tables. Um, so, so to, uh, you can also allow your uh, synthesizer just to have longer, uh, longer times to, uh, to, uh, to trade off. Uh, different uh, different choices to uh, to fulfill your timing constraints. So what you do is you set up the timing constraints, and then you let the synthesizer try and uh, try and make it work. It may may mean that your implementation run times are going to be pretty long, but uh, that's going to probably help you. Um, so they don't recommend that you uh, try and specify the logic block resources. Uh, if you do uh, do license or buy IP uh, solutions, you should pick ones that are designed for the 7 Series. And remember, all the 7 Series FPGAs, the Artrex, the Vertex, um, the I forget what the other is, the Kintex, I think. Those are all, those are all, they have the same type of configurable logic blocks. Everything in the 7 Series does. So so if the IP is designed for seven series, it'll work on any of those any of those chips. Um, you can, in theory, instantiate these features directly, but uh, you really should avoid doing that um, because it 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 uh, constrains the synth synthesis tool and may may prevent it from re really getting an optimum solution. Uh, all right. So some of these uh, some of these multiplexer primitives you can use to actually uh, create these wider uh, eight to one and sixteen to one multiplexers. Okay. So I think that that covers sort of some of the advanced features. I did want to sort of mention those things, um, but we don't really have to spend a lot of time any more time than that. Let me, um, let me get rid of this, and then uh, just a few questions on a few. Um, okay. All right. All right, so just kind of some guidelines on the test. I've already covered, I've done some review already, but we'll just do some more review. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll do one of those where we actually... Um, uh, 
uh, I'll do it. I'll try and do live. Maybe I'll do, maybe the ones I'll do after Thanksgiving, I'll do live. And you can, uh, if you can, you can show up. Um, or maybe I'll try and do them and I don't know. I'll figure out something. I'll, I'll try and do them at normal class time. If you can come, great. I'll record them and I'll upload the recordings. That's what I'll do, I guess. All right. So hopefully some students will show up and ask questions and it'll make it more uh, realistic. I probably should have been doing that all along. I don't know. All right. So, um, so the test is going to cover just general design concepts and flows. So, uh, you know, the concepts where you, you know, sort of start with the, with the behavioral model, kind of the big idea of what you're going to do, how you break it down into simpler pieces, and then just uh, setting up some design rules. Uh, obviously, uh, we're, we'll talk about combinational design, sequential design. I, uh, I, I do want you to review state machine charts, although um, I, probably ask, I probably will ask some questions. I might even give you a, a simple chart. And have you and have you describe some solutions? Remember, you can do it straight off the state machine chart. You go ahead and you assign the do the flip flop uh, the flip flop assignment, and then you can do it right off the state machine chart. Um, and then how you would uh, instantiate how you declare a module, how you instantiate a module. Um, uh, you should know a little bit about variable types and names, operators. Uh, you should know the difference between the dot syntax and position syntax, both for module instantiation and also for um, for parameter instantiation, or for parameter, yeah, instantiation, I guess. Um, you should know uh, you should know how you can use always blocks, uh, when you should use blocking, when you should use non-blocking, the difference, when you have level signals in the sensitivity list, when you don't, when you have edge signals. Um, and how you can't mix level and edge. Um, you should, gen, F, FPAs in general, you should know that some, some are flash based and some are static random access memory based like the Xilinx products. And you should know some of the pros and cons. Um, you should know a few sp general ideas about the chip we used. You should know that it has 324 pins. Uh, you should know generally you know have a rough idea of kind of how um, you know how fast it can run uh, you know roughly how many uh, how many uh, configurable logic blocks it has um, so and what do we say actually I think um, maybe I'll pull that back up I've never memorized that number so I probably wouldn't ask you to memorize it but I would like you to sort of know let's see where was that is here. Um, so it was yeah here. So it's about fifteen thousand eight hundred, almost just a little less than sixteen thousand slices. So here. Yeah, a little less than 16,000 slices. And there are two slices for each logic block. So something something like 63,000 LUTs and 126,000 flip-flops. So, you know, so if you know there's a few, you know, between 50 and 100,000 LUTs and and a little over 100,000 flip-flops that you know I'd be happy with that just some ballpark ideas all right um, so uh, test benches you should know a little bit about test benches you should know that we instantiate the your top level module you should know that the test bench provides all of the all the signals in the port list it provides all the inputs and it accepts all the outputs and evaluates them. It can evaluate them just by presenting them to you in a timing diagram, letting you look at it, or it can actually uh, have uh, the correct answer stored for the exemplars you're gonna present and test to see if it gets the right answers back. You should just have a rough idea of the steps that we go through uh, in Vivado in, in a design. And you should know what the constraint files are used for and uh, 
and just some of the considerations about simulation. That we can do a pre-synthesis simulation, we can do a post-synthesis simulation, that, uh, we, that our simulations are going to be as accurate as the, uh, as the timing data that we provide in our file, in our, in our HDL code. Uh, you should know a little bit about the labs you did and a little bit about test two. Kind of go back and maybe uh, uh, just uh, look at the, you know, maybe review your turn in sheets from the laboratories. There might be some questions right off those. Um, all right, so those are mostly the, the things I wanted to cover. Um, so, um, so I think that that'll probably do it for now. Um, so I, uh, I think I, I don't want you to get too freakazoided about the final. I don't, you know, it's not going to be all that difficult. It should be pretty straightforward for you. Um, so I, uh, so do some review. You'll be okay. Primarily, I want you to put your time in on the, on your project and, 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 and get it done. Uh, it's going to take, it's probably going to take you about 10 to 15 hours of work. Now, if you're, if, you're, if you're taking a lot longer than that, let me know. I'll try and give you some help. Uh, it, it's hard to sit down and look at your code and debug it. That's almost impossible. But, uh, but what is possible is to try and give you some pointers. Um, remember, uh, break it down into modules and, and write the modules and test them so you know your modules are working correctly. And you know that, uh, that when you send... When you instantiate the module and you send signals to it, you know what you're going to get back and that it's going to be the right thing. So you should you should set up, uh, you should try and start off with a block diagram and lay out your entire uh, project. And it's going to be a state machine. So figure out what your states are going to be. And then as much as you can, uh, try, and, try and have nothing but the state machine in your top level module and all the functionality broken out into modules. So you call a you, so you call a module to uh, to display letters in the seven segment displays. Um, you talk, you call modules to uh, to uh, you know process answers and display uh, display information for answers. So make sure uh, you know make sure you use modules uh, as much as you can, and if you get all the modules working correctly and then you just have your state machine in your top level module then that should make it a lot easier to debug things all right um, sounds good all right I think I'll quit with that and we'll um, see you later